AI has burst into our imagination, our culture, and our daily lives. Because after decades of trying, companies have learned to train it very quickly on huge amounts of our data. And now it can do battle with customer service agents. $100. We went from a $20 discount to a $100 discount in seconds. Even as the creator of the technology, sometimes I'm surprised. Create digital remixes of human creativity. The godlike power to commission any artist in history. Yeah, hmm. that's the fun part. And even catch a glimpse of our thoughts. Wow, so as long as I have seen it and you know the patterns of my brain, then the AI will read that out of my brain. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. exactly. AI advocates like former Google CEO Eric Schmidt says it all has tremendous potential. Getting better materials, solving climate change, managing our energy systems better. There's a lot of reason to think that this technology can do all of that. And already it does miraculous things. At Cincinnati Children's Hospital, Dr. John Pestian and Dr. Tracy Glauser are training their own AI to head off suicide in children. It can give a pediatrician an at-a-glance sense of which kids need immediate intervention. An output will say this is a patient at high risk, this is a patient at low risk, or we just don't have enough data right now. Roughly 30 to 40 percent of mental illness, adult mental illness, started as a, as a child. And so you want to be able to pick that up early. They spent millions on building and training it by pouring electronic medical records, records of doctor's visits, even suicide notes through it. What had most value in, in prediction and classification is the ratio of nouns to pronouns. Because those that aren't suicidal are those that w will use the word I more often than those who are suicidal and they don't refer to themselves. So if in the language of the suicide note they refer to things other than themselves more yes. often, they're yes. more likely to commit suicide. Exactly. Exactly. Now that project is pretty amazing. A custom-made, expert-built, potentially life-saving artificial intelligence. But that is the exception. It's not the norm. The AI that you are most likely to encounter in your life is built by a handful of for-profit companies using data you never realized they were collecting. And increasingly, it makes decisions about things that are really important to you, whether you know it or not. Life and death decisions are being made by automated decision-making systems, and they're determining people's access to government support for housing, food, medical care. University of Baltimore law professor Michelle Gilman and her students help people fight for benefits that have been wrongly denied them. And increasingly, she finds out that algorithms bought from a secretive company are at fault. I've been in hearings where no one in the room can describe for me how does the algorithm work? What factors does it weigh? How does it weigh those factors? And so you're really left unable to make a case for your client in those circumstances. You're in this sort of Kafka-esque loop in which there is nobody making a decision and no one who is in theory in charge of making decisions has any idea how the decision was made. Right, but yet at the same time, uh, many of the decision makers, the judges, give undue deference to the automated system because they think it's a computer. It's mathematical, it must be right. Gilman says that once upon a time when people could come into an office like this one to get things sorted, there were problems, sure. The potential for harm is just much greater when these flaws are embedded in algorithmic systems. The invisible power structures we are assembling by accident and on purpose have the potential to change not just individual lives, but the very future of humanity. This isn't intelligence. This is basically a sort of warped mirror of what's on the internet for the last 20 years. Meredith Whitaker was an early AI researcher at Google. She left after leading walkouts over military contracts and Google's handling of executive misconduct. Google made several changes to its products and policies after the outcry. But Whitaker says it's the issues around AI that worry her most. What it really is, is a probabilistic engine designed to spit out things that seem plausible based on a prediction of you know, how this should look that is based on massive, massive amounts of, you know, effectively surveillance data that has been scraped from the web. Today, she's the president of the anonymous messaging app Signal, part of what she says is an effort to cut off the data fuel supply of AI. She says that the same companies who collected data on all of us without any regulation for the last 20 years are using it to now build AI, again without regulations. Let's be real. There are only a handful of companies in the world that have that com combination of data 
and infrastructural power capable of creating what we're calling AI from nose to tail. What is the shortcoming of there being this very small number of models upon which a whole ecosystem is theoretically going to be built? Well, I mean, I think it's the, it's the danger of concentrated power. And it's the danger of a concentrated power that has extraordinary ability to shape our social and political landscape. We are now in a position where, you know, this, I would say, overhyped technology is being created, distributed, refined, calibrated, and ultimately shaped to serve the economic interests of these same handful of actors. Whitaker says there is nothing innately socially positive about a system sold as a replacement for human judgment and built for profit. So the idea that this is going to sort of magically become a source of social good or that this is a, you know, kind of a natural substance that all of us have the ability to use equally and, hey, teachers will be using it and students will be using it and nonprofits will be using it is simply not true. That's a fantasy used to market these programs. So who are these people making AI and why are they doing it? What do they believe about the future? I mean, if AI has the potential to make everything more efficient, but also poses the risk of making it such that we can't do things any other way, why do they think that gamble is worth it? The creator of ChatGPT, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman, declined to speak with us. But he has spoken openly about his desire to build not just AI, but AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence, a theoretical future technology in which AI truly thinks for itself and surpasses human intelligence. Altman ruminated openly on this podcast about his enormous optimism and ambition when it comes to AI. I mean, I hate to sound like utopic tech bro here, but if you'll excuse me for three seconds, like the, the, the level of... The increase in quality of life that AI can deliver is extraordinary. We can make the world amazing. And his company, now part of Microsoft, says it wants to go far beyond chatbots, recently writing, our mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence, AI systems that are generally smarter than humans, benefits all of humanity. Some in the AI community were appalled. They think they are positioned to decide what benefits all of humanity, wrote one prominent University of Washington professor. The topmost people at AI companies tend to say they believe they are building something world-changing. I'm extremely excited about what's going to happen because when these things are 10 and 100 times larger, they're going to be much more useful in terms of solving the problems of the world today. Climate change, Climate human change, conflict. science, um, new strategies, new ideas. Mm. They will write poetry in great ways. They will inspire humans. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt has been an advisor or boss to Altman and other top U.S. AI builders. Do you feel like, is the community of AI leaders that you're part of also in agreement on, on what the potential is in the future, AGI and the rest of it? Yeah, in one, I mean, they differ on time. Schmidt, like Whitaker, says that the number of companies capable of building true standalone AI systems is very small. I think eventually there'll be 20 or 30 such groups spread around the world. I don't really know. Today there are roughly four or five, depending on how you count. The models that they're training are 50 to $100 million a copy, literally the training. And at the moment, that small group enjoys little regulation or oversight and no meaningful public input as to whether this technology should be deployed. The key issue from my perspective is how do we put guardrails on the worst behaviors and how do we get international agreement on what those things are? But he says that with certain industry-crafted guardrails in place, the companies making these systems are the ones that should be trusted to figure it all out. My concern with any kind of premature regulation, especially from the government, is it's always written in a restrictive way. What I'd much rather do is have an agreement among the key players that we will not have a race to the bottom. You've described the need for guardrails, and what I've heard from you is we should not put restrictive regulations from the outside, certainly from policymakers who don't understand it. I have to say, I don't hear a lot of guardrails around the industry in that. It really just as I'm understanding it from you, comes down to what the industry decides for itself. When this technology becomes more broadly available, which it will, and very quickly, the problems are going to get much worse. I would much rather have the current companies define reasonable boundaries. It shouldn't be a regulatory framework 
it maybe shouldn't even be a sort of a democratic vote. It should be the expertise within the industry helping sort that out. The industry will first do that mm. because there's no way a non-industry person can understand what is possible. Mm. It's just too new, too hard, there's not the expertise. There's no one in the government who can get it right. But the industry can roughly get it right, and then the government can put a regulatory structure around it. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.